pleasant good evening again to all who are joining me for this live Bible study. Welcome to my living room. This is Reverend Arden Scott of the Calvary Pentecostal Church located in Kumana Village, Toko. And tonight I welcome you to our Bible study session. We are about to begin. So let's open with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit tonight's Bible study into your hands. We pray, God, that you will speak by your spirit and you will speak by your word. We pray, God, that you will open our minds, that we will understand the word. And we will know the truth of the word. And in knowing truth, we shall be made free. I pray, Almighty God, that my hearers, O God, will receive the word with gladness. And that they will add faith to them. That they will be strong. And they will, O God, be able to give to every man a reason for their hope in Jesus Christ. Pray everything would proceed decently and in good order. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. So let's begin. Hallelujah. All right. Tonight we have a very interesting Bible study. I am about to do what I would like to call a doctrinal investigation into some questionable teachings that have begun to creep into our Christian churches. And I will direct your attention to the board. And I'm hoping that you are able to see clearly and read some of these teachings. I have listed three of those questionable teachings. And tonight we will take a, a closer look at these teachings to see if these things can can withstand biblical scrutiny. So follow on the board as I read. Firstly, there are some persons who believe that the term by his stripes we are healed does not refer to healing for our bodies, physical healing. But it refers to forgiveness of our sins, spiritual healing. Secondly, there are those who believe and teach that the gifts of the Spirit were specifically given to the 12 or 11 apostles for the specific purpose of authenticating their message. But, they, but these gifts were not given to anyone else. So that these gifts have ceased with the death of the apostles and are not relevant to today's church. We will look at that. And lastly, number three, there are those who believe that believers today don't have any authority to bind Satan. As I said, tonight we will be taking a closer look at these teachings that are creeping into Christianity. And we want to see if these teachings are able to withstand Bible scrutiny. We are here for one hour. And post your questions. I will get your questions and I will answer your questions. Before I go on, let me encourage you. You have to have your Bible. So if you do not have your Bible on you, I am asking you to run quickly. Get it wherever it is. Amen? So that you will be able to follow with me tonight because Tonight we will be getting into the word. Amen. Now, these statements, or these teachings, I should say, before I go on, let me say that these views are formed by a branch of Christianity that call themselves cessationists. So you will see on the top of the board I have the word cessationists or cessationism versus continuationism. Um, and cessationists or cess 
cessationism is a construct from the word cease, and it is used to describe those persons within Christianity that believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit has ceased. Simple as that. And on the other side of the coin, those persons within Christianity who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit continue to be relevant and available and in use today, those persons are called continuations. Of course, all persons who are under the Pentecostal and Charismatic banner, you fall under the heading of continuationists. I myself am a continuationist. I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are still relevant. Now, when we have discussions like these, I want you to understand that most persons within God's church have what I call denominational biases. And that is only natural because you would be indoctrinated within the denomination where you were saved. Now, the real challenge in Christianity and in exegesis, which is right interpretation of God's word, the real challenge is in maturing to the point where you are free from your denominational biases, your denominational blinders or blinkers as I like to call them, and you reach a, state, a stage of maturity where you are able to think objectively. You are able to think outside of the barriers of your denomination, and then you are able to see the world for what it is. All right? Unfortunately, very few people in God's church are able to accomplish that. Right? That process has started for me. So that I am able to say that though I am a Pentecostal, I am able to see the Bible for what it is and not necessarily see the scripture through Pentecostal lens. The, the, the test that you can you can put yourself through in order to know if you are if you have arrived to that place of maturity and you are able to see the scripture for what it is. The acid test is if you are able to see your own faults within your own denomination. Once you come to that place where you are able to see not just the faults of other denominations or what I like to call doctrinal flaws. But when you are able to see the doctrinal flaws within your own denomination, that is good evidence that you have begun to mature and grow and evolve past your denominational uh, blinkers. Now, if you are in a church or denomination where everyone else is wrong to you and you believe that only your denomination has the truth and your denomination has all the truth, I am saying to you, do not trust yourself, because bet your bottom dollar, there are many things you are not seeing. For instance, I am a Pentecostal, and most Pentecostals believe that unless you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the gift of speaking in tongues, you are not saved, and yet I don't believe that. I am a Pentecostal, and a lot of Pentecostals believe that when someone says, thus say the Lord or I receive a vision from God, whatever they say following that is as good as scripture. And again, I don't believe that. For everything that is spoken must be verified against what is written. Are you understanding? I am also a Pentecostal, and I, and I realize a lot of Pentecostals believe falling down in the spirit is the ultimate manifestation of the power of God. Neither do I believe that. Are you with me? So, we realize that we, if we all have some loopholes within our, our teaching. None of us are perfect. But what I do believe is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to God's church and they are still relevant today. So without further ado, let me go to these questionable teachings. And begin at number one. The term by the stripes we are healed does not refer to healing for our bodies, physical healing.
when it refers to the forgiveness of our sins. In recent times, I have observed that this statement or this teaching has begun to become very popular within Christian circles. And let's see if this statement is correct. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, that God, Jesus Christ, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed on him, and with his stripes we are healed. And that is where that concept is taken from, or that truth is taken from. And, and we often quote that verse in reference to God's healing power to heal our bodies. But there are some who will claim that the verse has nothing to do with healing sickness, but the verse only has to do with the forgiveness of our sins. To support their argument, they usually reference 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says this, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. So this is Peter making a case for the forgiveness of our sins. And Peter says in this verse, concerning Jesus, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, that is just a very long, complicated King James way of saying that Jesus Christ carried our sins in his body. Amen? So Peter is saying that Jesus carried our sins in his body, and he carried our sins to the cross. And he went on to say that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. And he says, by whose stripes we are healed. In other words, Peter is saying by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. And in this verse, Peter is referring specifically to spiritual healing, or in other words, we are forgiven of our sins. So persons who cite this verse, they conclude that this is an interpretation of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and that the interpretation is that by the Lord Jesus' stripes, we are forgiven of our sins but we are not healed of our sicknesses. Now we must understand that Peter is not attempting to make an interpretation of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 in its entirety. What Peter is doing is Peter is building his own argument in this chapter concerning our forgiveness of sins and Peter is borrowing from Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 in order to lend to his argument. So Peter doesn't quote the whole verse. What Peter does is that he quotes part of the verse because his intention is to borrow from that verse, Isaiah 53 5, in order to support his argument that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, our sins were forgiven. So Peter says, and Peter's argument is that Jesus carried our sins to the cross and he is quite correct because after all the verse in Isaiah 53 5 it did say that Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities so obviously he carried our sins to the cross but is that all that Jesus carried to the cross now before I go back to Isaiah 53 let me read over 1 Peter 2.24 for you in the New Living Translation NLT version. Hear what the NLT says. It says, 1 Peter 2.24, He personally carried our sins in his body. I just needed to read that over just to support the interpretation of the King James English that you would see in your King James Bible where it says, His own self bear our sins in his own body. It simply means he carried our sins in his body, right? Amen. Now, the question is this. Is that all Jesus carried in his body to the cross? Is sin all Jesus carried in his body? In order for us to get a full interpretation 
of Isaiah chapter 53 and what the prophet Isaiah is trying to say. We cannot lean on 1 Peter chapter 2, 24 alone. What we should do is rather go back to the source of the truth or, or the source of the teaching. So we should go back to Isaiah chapter 53. And when we go to verse 5, we see that verse, verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgression. The first observation that we make is that the verse begins with the word but. And we all know that sentences do not begin with the word but. So it means that the teaching in verse 5 is a continuation of something that was said in our previous verse. So when we see but, we mean that the thought or the teaching communicated in verse 5, it cannot be grasped in its entirety in verse 5 alone. You have to go to the beginning of the teaching. So we need to step back to verse 4. When we go back to verse 4, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, hear what it says. It says, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Aha! So we get that clue tonight. We see that Isaiah is making a case. You see, one of the problems in interpreting with interpretation is when we interpret scripture by looking at part of what the Bible has to say on a topic, and we do not look at the whole of what the Bible has to say on a topic. And if we only look at what a part of what the scripture has to say on any given topic, we will we will arrive at part of the truth. In other words, we will end up with a half-truth. And a half-truth is as good as a lie. So we read verse 4, Isaiah 53, and we realize that Jesus did not only carry sins in his body to the cross, but Jesus carried our grief and our sorrows. Are you understanding? So the Bible says, he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Are you with me? We did esteem him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. And the Bible says, but he was wounded. In other words, so therefore, we, since we are healed of everything that Jesus carried in his body to the cross, it means that we are healed of our transgressions. We are healed of our iniquities. We are healed of our griefs. We are healed of our sorrows. Are you understanding? Because Jesus did not only carry our transgression and iniquities to the cross in his body, but he also carried our griefs and our sorrows. But we can take it a step further. When we make an interesting jump to the book of Matthew chapter 8, we see in Matthew chapter 8, Verse 16, verse 16 says that Jesus healed many and cast out devils. And then in verse 17, hear what verse 17 says concerning Jesus' ministry. It says that if these things were done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Another clue. <laughs> what Matthew, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, is saying in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17 here is this. That where Isaiah 53, 4 says Jesus carried our griefs and he carried our sorrows, that verse is interpreted in Matthew 8, 17, to mean that Jesus carried our sicknesses and our infirmities. So then, we realize that Jesus did not only carry our sins in his body, but he carried our griefs, our sorrows. And according to the Bible's interpretation, and I always advise you, you, you must use scripture to interpret scripture. And when you do so, you are guaranteed to get 100% truth. And according to the interpretation of scripture, 
grief and sorrows are sicknesses and infirmities. So in future, and I say this to those persons who would have misunderstood the verse, and even to charismatics and Pentecostals who honestly quote verses that they themselves don't even fully understand. And all you can tell is that many times they don't even quote the whole verse. You see, if you are speaking and if you are quoting by the stripes we are healed in reference to physical healing, then you cannot or you should not begin quoting from verse 5 alone. You should really begin quoting from verse 4. And while you are praying and say, Lord, surely you carried my grief and sorrows, or, or, or as is interpreted, you carried my sicknesses and infirmities. Then you move on to verse 5 and then quote, by your stripes I am healed. That means you fully understand what you are quoting. Sometimes we quote things we don't really understand, but I am trusting God that you understand. So that as you go forward, quoting the verse in relevance to healing for your body, you will quote it with the understanding and with greater faith. Hallelujah. Uh, so I will then move on to statement number two. Are there any questions? I encourage you, if you have questions, you can post your questions. Amen. Are there any questions? All right. Let's go to number two. Praise the Lord. The second question of our teaching that is being taught by cessationists, and as I mentioned, persons who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. And because of their wrong belief, they are making a lot of wrong interpretations. And they are not, not just making wrong interpretations, but biased interpretations in order to support their doctrinal positions. So when you have a, a preconceived bias, it will cause you to run into error and make the kind of interpretations that persons make, for example, in number one. Now we look at number two. The gifts of the Spirit, I will divide this statement into three parts. A, the gifts of the Spirit were specifically given to the 12 or 11, where we understand that Judas hung himself. So at the Great Commission, Jesus spoke to 11 apostles. Then, B, for the specific purpose of authenticating their message and no one else. We want to look at the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit. We want to see if we can limit the purpose to just authenticating the, mes the message of the apostles or if the gifts of the Spirit were given for more purposes than that. And then we're looking at C. So that these gifts are ceased with the death of the apostles, and they are not relevant to today's church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The gifts of the Spirit were specifically given to the 12 or to the 11 apostles. Let's see if that statement could withstand Bible scrutiny tonight. Persons who teach and believe this, they claim that when Jesus spoke to the apostles, Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, and he gave them the great commission, go ye into all the world, etc. And he told them, these signs shall follow, you shall cast out devils, heal the sick, etc. Persons who believe that these gifts were specifically given to the apostles and to no one else, they claim that when Jesus spoke, he spoke to the audience before him. Meaning that he spoke specifically to the 11 guys, the 11 apostles that were before him, and he did not speak to us. So they claim that we are in error. When we read the words, Jesus spoke to his apostles, and we take those words for ourselves. Believe it or not, this is a teaching of cessationists. 
And they say that we make a wrong interpretation by accepting the words for us because the words were not intended for us. The words were not intended for the, the general membership of God's church. These gifts that Jesus gave were intended specifically for the 11 apostles before Jesus. Let's see how true that is. Number one, the apostle Paul, he was not in audience when Jesus gave the great commission. In fact, Paul was not even saved. In fact, Paul was a persecutor of the church. So Paul was no way near there when Jesus spoke to the 11 apostles. Yet, after Paul got saved, not only did Paul receive the Holy Ghost, but Paul manifested the same gifts of the Spirit that they claim Jesus gave only to the eleven. So we see that Paul rose the dead, Acts chapter 20, verses 9 to 12. You can read it. Paul was preaching. A guy fell off a windowsill, three locks down, and Paul prayed for him. The guy fell, and he fell down. He died. Paul prayed for him, and he rose from the dead. Acts chapter 20, verses 9 to 12. We also see that Paul also healed the sick. The book of Acts chapter 28 said that Paul became shipwrecked in an in a, in a island called Meleta. And a snake bit him. He shook off the snake. And thereafter, the chief man of the island, a guy called Publius, his father got sick. Paul prayed for his father and his father was healed. When his father was healed, they brought many sick from the island to Paul, and Paul prayed for them, and they were all healed. And Paul was not in audience when Jesus spoke. So then we realize that this statement that the gifts of the Spirit, miracles, healing, were only for the eleven, it is not true by Paul. But maybe then you can say Paul is an apostle. So maybe they may say, they may give the argument, well, Paul was not in audience with the 11 apostles, but God called Paul to be an apostle. And maybe they can make the statement, well, these gifts, miracles and gifts of healing, are given to apostles. So Paul manifested, though he was not in audience when Jesus spoke, but he manifested the gifts because he was an apostle. Well then, let me go to my second point. There is a man called Stephen, who was not an apostle. The Bible says in Acts chapter 6 that Stephen, together with another guy called Philip, they were chosen by God not to be church leaders, pastors, prophets, apostles, um, teachers, evangelists. They were chosen by God to be servants, to serve tables, because the apostles decided that they could not be in combat with serving tables, but they had to give themselves wholly to the word of God and pray. So they said, search out seven men full of the Holy Ghost, etc. And the purpose or the job spec of these seven men was that they would assist in the task of serving tables. They were called to be servants, diaconos, helpers. Where we get the word deacons from. They were called to be helpers. And the man called Stephen, he was not an apostle. Yet he demonstrated spiritual gifts. The Bible says in Acts chapter 6 verse 8 concerning Stephen. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Full stop. So then, we see a situation where a man who is not an apostle, and who was not among the eleven, not only did he receive the Holy Ghost, but he manifested gifts of healing and gifts of miracles. Let's go to the third witness, a man called Philip, who was also chosen to be a servant. Philip was not an apostle, yet he received gifts of the Holy Ghost and demonstrated miracles. Here what the Bible says concerning Philip. Acts chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. It says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, Philip also cast out devils, crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. 
So Philip performed healings and miracles. He cast out devils. He healed those sick with the palsy. That's, that's persons who were crippled. And persons who were lame. And Philip was not even an apostle. Number four. We realize that a man called Ananias who was not an apostle, he was not even one of the helpers, he was an ordinary member of the church. His name was Ananias. And this is the man who prayed for Paul when Paul came down with blindness so that Paul would be healed. Hear what the Bible says about Ananias. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. And, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on Paul, on himself, brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, had sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from, from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose, and he was baptized. This healing was done through the hand of Ananias, laying his hands on Brother Paul. Ananias was no apostle. Number five, we realize that Acts chapter 1 verse 15 says that on the day of Pentecost, in the upper room, there were 120 disciples gathered. Acts chapter 5 verse 15, the number of them were about 120. Out of the 120, only 11 of them were apostles. And then they they cast lots, they prayed to God, and they chose a twelfth man to replace Judas. His name was Matthias. So then I could then say, out of the one twenty, twelve of them were apostles. After they chose Matthias. So it means that in the upper room there were 108 persons who were not apostles. Who were not there when Jesus Christ gave the promise of healing and miracles and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Yet on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, the Bible says the Spirit of God came and descended and baptized all of them that were in the upper room. And the Bible went on to say, they all began to manifest gifts of the Spirit speaking in tongues, including the 108 persons who were not apostles. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. Hear what it says. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance. And lastly, I could give reference to the fact that during Jesus' earthly ministry in Galilee, we all know that Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. And he told them to go preach the gospel, heal the sick cast out devils. What a lot of the cessationists forget because they often quote Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 which says that Jesus sent out his 12 but they often forget to quote Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 verses 1, 9 and 17. And let me read it for you. Luke chapter 10 here where it says after these things verse 1 after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. 70. Jesus did not only send out his 12, but Jesus Christ sent out 58 extra men than the 12. He sent out 70 men. The Bible says here in verse 1, And sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Hallelujah. Look what it says in verse 9. And heal the, this is what Jesus told us seven day. Heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come unto you. Look at verse 17 now. The 17, the Bible says in verse 17. And the 17 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even devils are subject unto us through thy name. In other words, we have a situation where, in addition to the 12 apostles, there are 58 men who were not apostles. And they received authority through Jesus' name to not only heal the sick but to cast out devils. So then we can conclude. The gifts of the Spirit are specifically given to the apostles and to the apostles alone. Is this, is this teaching true? Can this withstand Bible scrutiny? 
The answer is no. Because from the six examples I just gave, we saw one apostle. We call him a delayed apostle. <laughs> he got saved after the initial, the initial 12 or 11. We saw one apostle called Paul. We, we saw two servants, Philip and Stephen. We saw Ananias, an ordinary member of God's church. And we saw ordinary men and women, the extra 108 in the upper room, and also the extra 58. The extra 58 that Jesus sent out when he sent out the, the 70. So in other words, I conclude, did only the 12 apostles receive spiritual gifts? Did only the 12 receive spiritual gifts? The answer is no. Are there non-apostles who also receive spiritual gifts? The answer is yes. Are spiritual gifts given to apostles or were they given to apostles only? The answer is no. Isn't that what the Bible taught us concerning the day of Pentecost, the gifts of the Spirit, the pouring out of the Spirit, prophesied by Joel and then cited by Peter? When we read Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, then Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and I will cast, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Then we get the understanding that God poured out the spirit and also gave the gifts of the spirit indiscriminately. Let me read, let me read it, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you will profit the more. Acts chapter 2, I am reading Peter's sermon concerning the point out of the Spirit. And here what he says. Acts chapter 2 verse, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, say God, I will pour my Spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. Now, in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled, on that day in Pentecost, as Peter claimed it was fulfilled, it means that not only men received the Holy Ghost and the gift of speaking in tongues, but women also, because the prophecy said sons and daughters, and it said maid servants. And we know that among the extra 108, there were women gathered. So in case someone may try to suggest that the Spirit of God and the gift of tongues only fell upon the 12 apostles, and not upon the remaining 108. Well, then the prophecy will disprove that. And it goes on to say, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters, and, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. What we see here is God making a case, a prophecy, that the Holy Ghost together with the gifts of the Spirit, prophesying, dreaming dreams, seeing visions, these things will be poured out indiscriminately upon all flesh, not only upon church leaders, not only upon apostles, but upon all flesh. The, verse, the prophecy went so far as to say, upon maid servants and servants. In other words, from the, from the so-called highest to the so-called lowest, all men who believe will receive the Holy Ghost and the manifestation of the gifts. So the idea that the apostles receive a special anointing with special gifts that the others did not receive, that is not supported by Scripture. Any questions? I encourage you to post your questions. We have about 20 more minutes to go. <laughs> you know how time flies when we are having fun. The second part, B. The Spirit was given to apostles for the specific purpose, specific purpose of authenticating their message and to no one else. What cessationists claim? is that these people who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are ceased. What they claim is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the anointing with miracles and signs and wonders were given specifically to the apostles for a specific purpose, which was to authenticate 
the gospel message that the early apostles preached for a specific time, which was the duration of the apostles' ministry. So then they claim that when the apostles' ministry was over, when they died, and after the apostles, uh, uh, Paul and Peter and Jude and so on, had written the New Testament, and the New Testament was completed, and these men died, well then they claim that there was no more need for God to authenticate their preaching and their writing. So then the gifts of the Holy Spirit discontinued as these men died and their ministry was completed. That is what they claim. Is this true? Can this withstand Bible scrutiny? Now, when he asks the wrong question, obviously he will get the wrong answer. So in order to answer this question, was the gift of the Holy Ghost given specifically to authenticate? We should rather ask the right question. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit and the giving of the Holy Spirit? That is the question we should ask. Why, simply, why was the Holy Spirit given? <laughs> Glory to God. And the answer to that question is quite simple. Because it is given by the Lord Jesus himself. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And what did Jesus say in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? He says, And you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Or you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Why was the Holy Ghost given? The simple answer. The Holy Ghost was given so that we receive power to be witnesses unto Jesus Christ. The next question then is this. How were they to be witnesses? I will give you five ways in which the early church members were called to be witnesses for Jesus. One, they were called to be witnesses by preaching and teaching the gospel. Secondly, they were called to be witnesses by writing and penning the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That is the reason why they gave emphasis. When they were about to choose Matthias, the criteria was that whosoever would replace Judas must be a man who was exposed to Jesus' ministry from the day he was baptized to the day he was res resurrected. The, the criteria was, was, not just, was not that he should be a man who saw Jesus. <laughs> the criteria was that he should be a man who was exposed to Jesus' ministry. What it meant is that he should be a man who was exposed to Jesus' teaching because the church depended on the first-hand witness of the apostles to retell the story. To, 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 to tell the teachings of Jesus by oral tradition into the ears of the church members. So in, order, so in order for the church to get trusted doctrine and information, they had to get it from men who were actually with Jesus and who heard this teaching firsthand. So therefore, they were called to be witnesses by writing the scripture so that as time went on, the apostles saw the need to write. Thank God that they did. And of course they were led by the Spirit of God. And I want you to understand that whilst they were writing, whilst Paul was writing his letters, whilst they were writing, they did not know that what they were writing would have been included in the Bible and become scripture. <laughs> you need to understand that. Alright? But that's another, that's an aside. Alright? So they so how were they to become witnesses? One, as I said, by preaching the gospel. Two, by writing the gospel. Three, by demonstrating signs and wonders, authenticating the gospel. So that is true, but it is not the whole truth. As I mentioned earlier, the key in good Bible interpretation is not to quote part of the truth and not to resist certain truths for the sake of not aligning with a camp that you are antagonistic against. But you must be honest as a Bible interpreter and as a child of God to declare all the truth that the word of God says. So yes, the gifts of the Spirit were given to authenticate um, the ministry of the apostles. And that was one way in which they were to be witnesses, by demonstrating gifts of healing and miracles. Uh, truth, number four, by delivering men from sin, 
from sickness and from devils. Number four, by delivering men from sin, sickness, and devils. In so doing, they were witnesses. Let me make, let me just look at that. Look, look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verses 14. It says, Bear with me in my Bible. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 verse 14. Verses 14 to 16, I believe it is. It says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. So we see here that the apostles do join men to Christ. Verse 15. It's so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So they were healing the multitude. Verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk, and them which were vexed with unclean spirit, and they were healed everyone. So therefore we see evidence that this is one way in which the, the early apostles were, were to be witnesses unto Jesus, by healing the sick. And bringing deliverance unto men, casting out devils through the name of Jesus. And number five, of course, they were to be witnesses, number five, by, most importantly, by agape love. Jesus himself said, don't forget that. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this all men shall know you are my disciples, by the love you have one for the other. And you notice that I did not say love, I said agape love which you can only demonstrate by empowerment through the Holy Spirit. So I saved the best for last. The apostles and the whole church for that matter, they were called to be witnesses. We, not because when Jesus spoke, he spoke with the intention that every member of the church who desired to be a witness, then what Jesus said would be relevant to them. And we are called to be witnesses. Amen. By preaching the word. Amen. Um, the apostles wrote the word. They demonstrated uh, gifts, signs, and wonders. Also, they ministered healing and deliverance and casting out devils. And fifth, most important, they demonstrated agape love. Now, the next question is this. Do we still need to be witnesses today? The early apostles needed to be witnesses then. <laughs> Jesus said, because Jesus said, this is the purpose for the giving of the Holy Ghost, that you be witnesses. And he gave the Holy Ghost, and back then they were witnesses. Now, do does that is that purpose still relevant today? Do we, the church today, need to be witnesses to Jesus just as they needed to be witnesses? Of course, the answer is yes. Yes. Do we still need to be witnesses? Yes. And let me just go to the five that I just mentioned. Do we need to preach and teach the gospel? The answer is yes. The early church did not have the written New Testament. They had the Old Testament, which, by the way, they counted as scripture. Paul said to Timothy that you have known the scriptures from our youth. Paul referred to the Old Testament writing as scripture. Alright? Nevertheless, that's another side by itself. But as I go on, are, are we called to be witnesses today? Yes. Right? Um, do we need to preach and teach the gospel? The answer is yes. The early church did not have the written New Testament. Alright? And they preached. Paul and Barnabas and they, they preached. Peter and so on. Now today we have the New Testament. The written New Testament. But guess what? Is it that we do not only need to preach? Is it that we win so simply by taking our Bible and giving it to sinners and say, go read our Bible and you'll be saved? No. The giving of the canon, because the secessionists believe and they teach that since the Bible is complete and the word is given, there is no need for gifts of the Spirit to, to authenticate the preaching. But they are wrong. Because we are required to preach the same way as the early church apostles and, and members were required to preach. Even though we have the completed Bible, we still have to preach the message. We don't give out scripture and depend on sinners to read the Bible to be converted. We because even if a sinner reads the scripture and the scripture is true, that doesn't necessarily mean that that alone will convince him. 
the Lord Jesus Christ told us specifically to preach. So that is why we continue to preach. And we have scripture and we are still preaching. And as much as we preach, we preach for the same purpose as the early church preached, to win sinners to Christ. And therefore, we need the same endorsement that the early church needed and got through the powers of the Holy Ghost with signs and wonders. So signs and wonders is still relevant today because the sinners and unbelievers still need to be convinced with signs and wonders in addition to the preaching just as they needed to be convinced back then. So do we need to preach and teach the gospel? The answer is yes. Do we need to write and, and, and pen scripture or, or to write doctrine? The answer is no. The doctrine has already been penned and the canon or the Bible books are closed. So listen, that is one thing that the early church did that we today and apostles today are not required to do. But then what are the other aspects of being a witness? Do we need to demonstrate signs and wonders to authenticate the gospel in China, in India, in Africa? Of course, the answer is yes. Do we need to deliver men from sin from sickness and devils to Christ? Well, of course, because there are still men that are sick. Demon possessed today, so the answer is yes. Do we need to practice agape love today? The answer is yes. In other words, we need to be witnesses today, just as they need to be witnesses yesterday. And we need the same. If you only look at part of what the scripture has to say on any topic, you will only come up with part of the truth on the topic. You have to look at all of what the Bible teaches in order to, to arrive at all Bible truth. So, the last part, see, we have five more minutes. It says so that these gifts have ceased with the death of the apostles and are not relevant to today's church. So the cessationists claim that the gifts of the Holy Ghost were only given to apostles and that did not withstand scrutiny and we understand that that is simply untrue. They claim that the gift of the Holy Ghost was specifically for the specific purpose of authenticating the gospel message and therefore after the gospel message was documented there is no more need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit but we understand that did not withstand Bible scrutiny and that statement is simply not true true because the gifts of the Holy Ghost were given for four other reasons other than authenticating the message. It was given for us to demonstrate brotherly love. It was given for us to be able to help the, the depraved, cast out devils, heal the sick. It was given for us to empower us uh, to be witnesses by preaching and teaching the gospel which we still have to do today. Are you understanding? And lastly now, so that they say that, the cessationists say that since the apostles have died, well then uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit has ceased. Because time is against us, I will put one nail to that casket, as they say. The Bible said in, in Mark chapter 16, Jesus said to his apostles, he said to them, let me read it. Mark chapter 16. Are there any questions? Mark chapter 16. Jesus said from verse 15, and he said unto, unto, unto the apostles, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believe not shall be damned. He said, These signs shall follow them that believe. And he went on to say, In my name they shall cast out devils, etc., etc. He also said, They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Listen to what Jesus said. He told the apostles to go and make believers. And then Jesus went on to say, These signs shall follow them that believe. That was spoken to us. The apostles were the first believers, and as they duplicated the faith of Jesus Christ and others, they created more believers, more believers, more believers, more believers. So Jesus, knowing full well that the apostles would preach and raise up a church, he gave a, a promise that would be relevant for all believers throughout all ages. So Jesus did not say, these signs shall follow you. Jesus did not say to them, these signs shall follow you, the apostles. <laughs> what Jesus said to them is, these signs shall follow all that believe. In other words, Jesus is making a clear statement. 
that those who will believe at the apostles' teaching, and those who will believe, those who believe from the apostles' teaching, and those who will believe, those who believe, who, do, who believe from the apostles' teaching, these signs will follow all of them. And what are the signs? They will cast out devils, they will lay hands on the sick. And that includes us. There is no scripture in the Bible that says that when the apostles die, the gifts of the Holy Ghost and the signs of the Holy Ghost die with them. There is no scripture. That is absolutely untrue. And if you want to say that the burden of proof is on you, <laughs> because the other side, the other argument is clearly described in the Bible. Jesus said, these signs shall follow a general claim you made, those that believe. And lastly, let me say something. In that same passage, Jesus gave some instructions in addition to the promise. He did not only give a promise of sign and wonders to the apostles, but he gave them an instruction. Here the instruction. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, go, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. So here it is. If according to the cessationists, the promise of healing and miracles was only for the current audience, the 11, the 11 apostles, but then if you make that premise with the promise, you have to maintain that premise with the instruction. So it means that the instruction to go into all the world was only for the 11 apostles. That is incorrect. <laughs> you cannot have one rule for the promise and another rule for the instruction. The instruction and the promise was given in the same conversation. So then, if the instruction to go into all the world and make disciples is true to us, and every Christian denomination believes that and practices that, then likewise, the promise to heal the sick, cast out devils, is also true. Because the instruction and the, and the promise was given with the same intent in the same conversation. The gifts did not die with the apostles. And I conclude. The gifts, this is my closing statement. And I thank you so much for joining with me here tonight. And I conclude. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were not only given to the apostles, but they were given to all that believe and distributed among the entire membership of the body of Christ to enable us to be witnesses unto Christ. So therefore these gifts have not ceased because there are still those that believe on the earth functioning as members of God's church. And we are still called to be witnesses unto Christ so that Jesus Christ is still granting the Holy Ghost with power to fulfill the purpose of being witnesses. This is Adam Jason Scott, pastor of Calvary Pentecostal Church, executing my Bible study via Facebook Live, given the circumstances of this pandemic. It was a first for me. It was a bit discomforting. Nevertheless, I am trusting God that you enjoy the time we spent together and that you learned a lot. And going forward, let me say that I welcome you to join me again next week Friday because there is a lot to learn. Until we meet again, continue to hold faith in Christ, stay strong, be blessed, and be able to give to every man an answer for your faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Good night.